you know, we really have a system that's not that's designed for the industry. It's not designed for the consumer. It's not designed to make the very best food. And this is a story about the land, really. I mean, if there's a scene where the lead character does not want to join the revolution, he does not want to take part in the action that takes place. And yet, and he's an ex-army officer, he says, but what better thing for a farm boy to do than to protect the land? If I'm going to give up my, if I'm going to take this risk and take a chance, then this is the thing I'd like to risk myself for. This is peak moment. We are living at a peak of human innovation, information, wealth, and health. But we're also at a peak of population and consumption with rising temperatures and declining resources fueled by cheap oil and gas. Peak Moment Television, bringing you examples of positive responses to energy decline and climate change through local community action. Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. I'm in Corvallis, Oregon, on a farm, the Sunbow Farm, which is owned by and run by Harry McCormick, who also co-founded Oregon Tilth, but we'll learn about that later. And I'm with Dan Armstrong, who's a novelist and the editor of Mud City Press from Eugene. Thank you both for joining me. Thank you for having us. A while back, Dan sent me this book called Prairie Fire. It's a novel. And I have to say, Dan, this baby is a page turner. I never thought that a book about farmers and <laughs> politics and stuff would, woo, was like, is fabulous. So I want to talk a bit about this book and what's behind it. Would you give give our viewers a sense of what's in this novel? Well, um, and why? Well, I'll, I'll, the simple story is I used to be a horror story writer, <laughs> and oh! uh, I uh, oh about twenty years ago I ran into a book called uh, The Final Empire by William Kotke. He's mm -hmm. an Oregon Oregon writer, and it was a, essentially a book about collapse, and it put all the pieces together the way we treat the land, the way we grow our food, mm -hmm. uh, the chemicals that are here, even our society, the way we think. So this is not a novel? This, this is not is a about, novel. This is about what's this happening? Is, this is a real environmental okay. collapse piece. And then after reading that, I was I had always thought about the environment, but I wasn't really worried about it so much. And this it changed my mind, changed my attitude. Mm -hmm. Shortly after that, I read a book uh, uh, called Who Will Feed China by Lester Brown of the World Watch Institute and the Earth uh, Policy Institute, and uh, these books changed my changed me significantly. And uh, as a writer, I thought I, I needed to be political, or at least to address the condition of the planet. And I made a pact with myself that I would write a an article on the environment every year, just do something, just to keep my head in. Well, it it got wild, and I started doing a bunch of them, and I was concerned that I was preaching to the choir, and I wanted a way to get this material out in a way that was entertaining. So mm -hmm. I, I thought, you know, I've been writing novels already in my life. I have some experience with that. I want to write a Tom Clancy adventure story with the grain market instead of atomic bomb at the center. So I wanted a, a racy, exciting novel that could draw people that were not necessarily concerned about the environment into the story and get this in the backdrop while my characters are running all over the place and, and creating fun. So that's... That's and and, and I, you know, this deserves to have that wider readership. I mean, it's right up there with the, the thrillers that you're talking about. Not only because you've got well-characterized characters. I mean, we have our, our, you know, Afghani veteran hero who's now a farmer um, who you can't help but love. But also we get to see the challenges he has within his family, within exactly. his community. Exactly. I mean, he's a real person. He's not, one, he's not just one-dimensional. Um, and, and you take us inside of the folks behind the big, the big grain corporation? That was the other thing that I wanted to do in a, in a novel sit, situation. And I wanted to kind of give the overview of how the whole world works mm -hmm. in, in a sort of a simplistic way. Of course, it's a novel. I can't get into complete details. But I wanted to show, you know, how the money trickles down, so to speak, from the very, very wealthy down to the next level, how they operate within Congress, how Congress operates within itself, how that affects the president. In the case of this book, mm. there's a presidential election. And I have a president that's, that comes in a liberal, not much different than our current president, uh, Obama. Right. Comes in a liberal, and when he gets there and he gets the background knowledge, the, the national security uh, daily briefs and, the under, and some of these, these pieces of knowledge he might not have known, it starts to change him. And so uh, part of this book is also about a president 
in the in the in the White House. Really, one trying to confront the power brokers, but then also understanding how little he can do about it, even in the most powerful position in the possibly the world. That was actually one of my favorite aspects of this book. Don't you think, Harry? Because because that president, what I I had never quite pictured how constrained he was by by not just Congress. We see that you know in our daily <clears throat> news, but by who's watching him, <clears throat> security. Folks that are watching National him. National security uh, community. Ooh, it was like he he can't he can't budge a shoe without somebody noticing. I mean, how he has to get the word out to our um, to the farmers group that are organized was like brilliant. I'm not going to give it away, um, but it really made me feel like he can do far less than we often hope. And he, and he confronts the oil industry and the mm -hmm. military industrial complex, so that's part of it. Another part of the story is I wanted to make that connection between fossil fuels and food and in, in a big picture. In other words, what's it look like on the global market? What, what does the shipping have to do? What does the large-scale uh, cultivation of the land do? And so uh, on one hand, you know, it starts to sound like I'm talking about a, a, a nonfiction book, but this is all the backdrop. It's the characters that carry the story, mm -hmm. and, and like mm -hmm. you say, the president's a big one. Another guy is uh, this uh, uh, Medal of Honor winner who comes back and is, retires. Uh, doesn't actually retire. I won't tell that part of the story, but he goes back to farming, and this, the conditions of the farming of the commodities market and the way that uh, there's a particular grain crisis that occurs in this book, these are all uh, things that draw him out and this is a book about revolution. I mean, the name Prairie Fire comes from the, the Weather Underground and the book that they put out in the early 1970s. And I, I deliberately did that. But the revolution I'm really talking about is agriculture and how we need to change. And uh, so um, when I wrote this book, I actually was concerned that I might get a lot of, uh, <laughs> have the FBI tracking me down or something like that. That hasn't happened. But that's probably just as well. When uh, you mentioned that the title Prairie Fire, and of course you open the book with a farmer um, burning his fields, and you know that's a that's powerful a scene. Very powerful scene, and I think really revealing at how desperate many of America's farmers were, and I'm going to guess are. So why? Tell me, tell me the, what's behind that? The, the burning of the fields. Well. And, and the situation for the American farmers and farming in general. I mean, the big, give us well, the story the, the, behind this. The angle I, that I approach, at least most directly in the story, is, is really the, the market mechanism. Especially the wheat, wheat field, wheat farmers, they actually sell their crops prior to planting. That's how they finance it. It's really backwards in a way. but So that means if they were to uh, finance their crop by selling their wheat in, the, you know, in January prior to planting, uh, to finance it, then if the price of wheat goes up in June, that's not the price they're going to get their wheat for. And we experienced this in 2008. I wrote the book in 2003, but in 2008 we had a tremendous grain crisis where the price of wheat hit $12 a bushel. I don't know if... if From we, where? I mean, where was it before? Well, it's been at $3.50 okay. for 30 okay. years, and okay. it essentially tripled or quadrupled just like the price of petroleum in the same year. This was a huge thing. And if you were to go back, you'd discover that very few of the farmers got that $12 a bushel. They got three fifty dollars a bushel because they'd sold it in the future. So that's the fire. Mm -hmm. In the story, the same thing happens, but instead of deciding to harvest, they say, well, we'll burn it rather than harvest it if we don't get another dollar per bushel. Because we feel that the market is actually set up in such a way that it doesn't give any advantage. It only gives advantage to the people with capital leverage. And this is, again, attracts the, the question of what is the free market? The free market is not free if certain pools of capital can leverage anything that happens. And that's really the backdrop of what's going on in this story. But uh, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one thing, I mean, it's also, it's more than just the, the commodities market. It's the way we manage the land. I mean, today, especially with the wheat and the corn in the Midwest, essentially that dirt acts as a substrate which we pass the fertilizers, the petrochemical fertilizers, through. They go. They grow up into the plants. They become what they become. But then those those fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides that are washed through into the watershed or into the food themselves. You know, we really have a system that's not that's designed for the industry. It's not designed for the consumer. It's not designed to make the very best food. Or the land. You or the land soil, itself. Because you started with William Kotsky and and 
Rick, would you tie those together? Absolutely. For us? You know, as as William Kotke says, you know, the um, the symptom of the disease of our society is our loss of soil, and without that soil, we're nothing. It's where we really where we all we grow everything we have. And this is a story about the land. Really, I mean, if there's a scene where the lead character does not want to join the revolution. He does not want to take part in the action that takes place. And yet, and he's an ex-army officer, he says, but what better thing for a farm boy to do than to protect the land? If I'm going to give up my, if I'm going to take this risk and take a chance, then this is the thing I'd like to risk myself for. Rather than guns in, in, in Afghanistan. That's right, instead of guns which in... Which he's already done. Yeah, so um, uh, this to me is, is the key. But again, I was a deal about writing this, this kind of wild story because it is... Uh, all over the place in many ways. Let's tell people to understand this in the backdrop. I know uh, I got a review written by a professor at the University of Nebraska, an agroecologist uh, professor there, and he wrote me a letter after he read it, and he said, you know, Dan, I really like this novel, but, but I want to use it in my agricultural classes. I want them to read this novel along with our textbooks because it lays out the way everything fits together. You know, we look in the textbook, we see one piece. How do we run uh, the combines? Yeah. How, you know, where does it go? What does it look like in the big picture? How, how do we store grain? How much grain do we have on hand? How much, how does that fit into feeding the entire populace of the world? And so it's kind of thrown out here in a, in a novel form. And, uh, um, you know, another part of this though, Jenea, that I, that you might not know about is this is, um, there's another book that goes with Prairie Fire and I'd like to give it to you because I don't think you've read it. And this is, you know, uh, it's called Taming the Dragon. It's a yeah, yeah, novel yeah. set in China. In at the same summer as this um, as Prairie Fire, and it's set at on the Yangtze River on the on the uh, Three Gorges Dam. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. to give the audience and maybe yourself an idea of what I was trying to do, I wanted to go through a scenario, and this really comes from Lester Brown in my reading of Lester Brown, is um, China produces more grain than any other country in the world, and but they keep it all home and they feed themselves. America, the United States produces a lot of grain, but we export quite a bit of it. It's one of our, it's really our petroleum compared to Saudi Arabia. Oh, we okay. have it's grain. A, okay. We've so been feeding the world a long time. We've been feeding the, the world yeah. a long time, yeah. essentially for more than a hundred years. Wow. So I went, I went through a scenario that I sort of made up. What if we had a mild winter in Southeast Asia? Something that would not be drastic, but a mild winter that the snowpack in the southern stretch of the Himalayas was down 20% something barely detectable because it stretches through several continents. No one would really pay much attention. Spring comes, not so much water in the, in the rivers in Southeast Asia, particularly China. All of a sudden, China's short on water that, that affects this dam. That's what the Taming the Dragon is about. Mm -hmm. what, does it, what happens to the Three Gorges Dam if the, if the Yangtze River is running at half volume? That's really the backdrop of the second book I've given you. However, and I treat the dam in that one, but what does it do to the grain crop in China? That, I was, and so that's so all the, that's where this grain crisis starts. A minimum snowpack in the Himalayas in a mild winter trickles down to the point where all of a sudden, where the grain crop in China is down 25 percent. Look again, that doesn't sound like a lot, but that's more than all the exported grain, uh, all the grain exported in a year for the entire world. In other words, that shortage. That much. Right, in Whoa. other words, so that's what starts the story. And, and I wanted to do a little event on one side of the globe mm -hmm. turns into mm -hmm. what becomes an agricultural standoff in the United States. And the two novels are made to be read independently. They are essentially separate books, but if you read them together, you actually get the backstory for the other story by reading the other one. So what I what what you're what you're saying to us is the, the interdependence here, the interlocking food systems here, I mean, I'm going to guess at least partly because of the growing population. Absolutely. Well, Absolutely. China is particularly a, you know, a major, major player. And if they're starving to death, that's going to affect, uh, you know. And if this scenario were happening now, let's think about this. If this were happening this year, right, China has enough surplus dollars on hand that they would be probably jacking up the prices of buying American grain, yes? Absolutely. So it wouldn't go to other countries. I mean, because you're dealing with market stuff here, not just food. Janae, you've hit it on the head. Absolutely. And that's what happens in the, in the novel. What happens is the Chinese actually do know what's happening prior to any other time. It's, actually, it's what happened in 1974 with the Russian, what they called the Russian grain robbery. When the Russians were having a shortage in the Ukraine, they had a bad crop, 
But they knew this before anybody else did. So they bought up the grain prior to the, the yeah. harvest, and then all of a sudden, the, you know, there, there's a shortage. And that's what goes on in this case. And so, uh, um, yeah, I would try to make, look at the puzzle of the world and see how each various piece fits together in terms of feeding ourselves. And, and in the end, it's, it's the grain that becomes, well, as uh, Harry will say, and part of a uh, discussion we've had many times is the grain really represents more than half of what we eat. And if you throw in the beans, it's something like 80% of what we eat are in these dry crops, these beans and, mm -hmm. and wheat. And so mm -hmm. um, I try to bring that across in the novel, and I like to bring it across in such a way that you don't have to be concerned about the planet or the environment to get that particular element. Our food really requires that we take care of this place. It's a garden planet. It's not, you know, this thing that's been given to us for our pleasure. It's something that we take care of, we maintain, we husband. And I think that's a very, very critical part of what that story is about. It sounds to me like in, you're not going to turn around and change the way the system works tomorrow alone with your novel, but it sure sounds like some stuff needs to get changed here well, in how we do things. Absolutely. And I think, you know, uh, this is what has led me to investigate the relocalization of the food system. Oh. And it, it oh. touches on the work that I do here in uh, the Willamette Valley particularly my work with Harry. Harry has been a, a pretty much a guiding light for me mm. in applying this knowledge that I learned talking about the global market. How, how do we deal with this thing? And, and I think we have an answer uh, to get it to actually be practiced and to make the necessary paradigm change. You know, that's a lot of work ahead of us. But, uh, you know, I think that's where it's leading. What would that look like? Even just here in the Willamette Valley, I mean, which is a fertile, flat well, you want, area. You I want mean, to know what it would look like. Yeah, we we have millions of acres here in the Willamette Valley, and we've actually got some numbers about what it would take to feed um, this local population. It will include Portland, Vancouver, Salem, Eugene. Um, we could probably do it on, what is it, 200 and something thousand acres. That's right. That's for right. beans and grains. Uh -huh. And we've got millions of acres, a lot of which is in grass uh, <clears throat> after... Pretty much after World War II. Wait a minute, I'm interrupting. Are you saying you have more than enough oh, way land more. in the Willamette Valley to feed enough grains and beans, you yes. know, 80% of our diet is what, for southern Washington State and... Yeah. Are you, do you, We're talking and from, from Portland down to the bottom of this valley. Three million, three and a half, three million, half million people. people. We could feed them all the greens. So you could become, actually, if you used most of this land, you could have become the breadbasket for Oregon, Washington or... Well, ourselves just ourselves. Just ourselves ourselves is all we're thinking uh -huh. about okay. at this and, point. Okay. Yeah. So, and, and part of part of the reason we think that way is because um, with this international market that we're talking that Dan's been talking about, another thing that happened in this valley was this was a major vegetable growing valley, which happened to have grain as a rotation crop prior to World War II. Okay. Um, after after World War II, things started to shift, and then it ra rapidly shifted in the fifties and sixties. And a lot of the uh, vegetable crops that were grown here for canneries, the canneries, because of labor costs, ended up going to Mexico and Chile. Mm -hmm. And there were three of them here in Corvallis, and I think two or three big ones in Eugene. A there, lot were, of the, there were 30 canneries in, in Salem in, in 1955. Salem. This and, was the uh, largest fruit and vegetable processing area in the world yeah. uh, 50 years ago. 50 I mean, years we ago. were producing enough wow. food to feed ourselves mm -hmm. then. It was a smaller population sure, by a third, sure. or no, by, by two-thirds. And, uh, and then on top of that, we were a major producer of flax for linen and oil, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and a major producer of hemp prior okay. to the petroleum industry taking that over. The hemp was also a major source for paper until that whole thing went into being forestry through another set of financial arrangements. Uh, so we have this ability here. We have a unique climate here. It's a... Uh, a maritime climate that, because we're close to the ocean on the western side of a mountain range, it has this long year-round season that pretty much, it has four seasons, but it's pretty much almost like one season. Mm -hmm. um, and it's tricky to grow in, but a lot of stuff will grow here, and especially the grains will grow here very easily. Um, people have lost sight of that, so when we started the Bean and Grain Project, um, People would say from specifically Oregon State University that you can't get the protein and the red wheat to be able to make bread. 
Well, we can talk about protein, and I think that's a, an interesting thing to talk about because you can run protein up and down in crops with just changing nitrogen fertilization. Hmm. It's really a measurement of nitrogen, and it's something that's used because it's simple to measure. What we need to be looking at in that grain is amino acids, and we just, hmm. we just had a bread come out this week on the market that's being made in Milwaukee. And it's Oregon, a, Milwaukee, Oregon. Milwaukee, yes, Oregon, okay. yeah. And it's all based on grains from a farm that's right down the road here, A2R, that a year and a half ago went into uh, Chapter 12 bankruptcy, and they showed up in my driveway and said, what, what can we grow? How can we do this? And I put them together with another big ryegrass farm that I've been working with for a couple of years at that point and is involved in the bean grain project and did a lot of the groundwork for the big farmers, Stalford Seed Farm. And I put them together with uh, Willow and Harry, and they became part of the group that we're working with. And now here we are a year and a half later, and we have flax, oats, and wheat from that farm in a bread that just came on the market in Milwaukee. That's a ma It's a major bakery. It's not a little dinky one. It's a major bakery. And that bread's in Fred Meyer, our co-op. It's in uh, New Seasons this week. It just came out this week. That's exciting. It's exciting. So what, you've, what you've, you're doing is sort of a, a test run in a, in a modest scale. It's a, modest, exactly. it's a modest scale, but what it's showing um, is a number of things. One of the first things that happened with Shelby, who's the baker, is that he um, neglected to get the protein tested in that bread, and he just took the wheat and used it. Yeah, and yeah. it made great bread. And then the protein tests came back, and they were 11% instead of 14 And he's going, so why does 11% mm -hmm. bread come out so nice mm -hmm. when it's not 14 And Mike down here, the farmer, said on camera, listen to what Harry's saying, and I'm getting it from Dr. Alan Kapler here in town, who I've written with in the transition document. Um, we shouldn't even think about the protein when we're thinking about an organic system that is growing these grains, beans, all the stuff we're trying to grow. We should be looking at the amino acid differences that make up the protein. We're, we're sophisticated enough with our science now so that we can do that. We can look at the amino acids that are making this 11% protein bread taste so good and work so well for a baker. Well, and I bet you what we're going to find is that there's different amino acids than in the 14% bread that's grown another way from somewhere else. And that, mm. what we begin to do then is we begin to shape a local wheat in this sense um, that's much like our local grapes here that have a vintage. So we'd have a vintage wheat from uh, a year with a certain kind of amino acid count. And it may be a vintage that is steady in this climate pretty much of the time. But it may be different in different years. And we, we have the lab abilities here in the valley to be able to check this stuff all the time and be sophisticated about it and use it in talking about making our local food what it is that we vibrate with as we mm -hmm, live here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's what's going to make people healthy is to eat the food that they're around. I'm going to interrupt for just a second because sure. we have about three minutes. I want people to know where they can find your books, Stan. Oh, okay. They're sure. great. They're really wonderful. Well, my books can be found at mudcitypress.com, which is a website that I operate and mm -hmm. own. Mm -hmm. And they're also on Amazon and all the other places. Yeah. But they're self-published. These are books I put out. And uh, the best way to do it is buy it directly from me on the sure, website. But sure. they're, they're out there. Yeah, thank you very much. Are there any other thoughts relative to what you've been writing here that, that include, I mean, and we'll get into this area as being an example. Any other thoughts that we didn't cover that you want to make sure viewers Well, get? one, and this is an uh, interesting one that's come up lately, is part of, uh, one of the big players in the novel is the Grange. The Grange nowadays is kind oh. of like a square dance operation. You know, it's a pretty low key. It's kind of mom and pop, soft core. Well, what I've done in the novel is I, I try to, reinvigorate the Grange and I make the Grange a player mm -hmm. in agriculture again and what's interesting about this is I got an email oh, about two months ago from one of the officers in the California Grange and he'd read this book and he said Dan you know I want to present this to the Grange I want I want relocalization I want localized food I want good organic food to be the new message of the Grange and they need a message and it's a, it's a difficult one I've been communicating with this man for three months now and mm -hmm. he's given a copy of the book to the head of California Grange who liked it but he also gave it to the president of the National Grange who thought it was a little bit uh, well we'll call it radical <laughs> <laughs> from, from, a from a Grange point of view sure so I, I just mentioned that uh, because you know in the end we may end up 
having to operate with the Grange because it's a system that's already in place, yeah. uh, already we organized. Actually, we actually use the Grange for some of our we, meetings we now. Think. And, yeah. and it's, inv it's getting invigorated in California. That's I right, it is. Which is really exciting. Particularly Northern California. Um, and so bringing it, bringing it back around after a hundred odd years of sort of, of some decline in here for the last half year, half century, um, so it seems to me that we're going to need to organize the folks who already have share the values. That's right. And, share the values you're talking about. And, and what's interesting is when you start talking about peak oil and climate change and environmentalism, you'll discover that the farmers in general tend to be conservative and they're, they're not really looking at it. But what I've discovered in talking with them is that if you change the words, but you still have the same dialogue, you take environment out, you discover that those farmers know more about the land than you do. Sure. Certainly sure. more than I know. And that you can actually have this conversation about relocalizing the food system in a conservative uh, forum and get positive responses. That's what I've discovered. And that, to me, I think is where the power is. We live in this crazy world where it's, everything's partisan, left, right, who knows what. Yeah. It drives me nuts because there's a middle ground. There's a gray zone in this. And I believe, you know, these, this topic of growing food, local food, this is where we can come together. It strikes me that everyone is, that's the first concern. How do we eat? How do we eat? How do we eat? And when we look ahead in the future, and if we're concerned about the price of petroleum, if we can eat, we can, if we have food, we can eliminate some of the civil disorder. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, if you keep mm -hmm. the people fed, they won't break in the glass on the grocery mm -hmm. store. They won't, mm -hmm. you know, who knows what could happen. But if you're fed, it's going to take a little of the edge off. And so... I think that's very critical. For right now, I want to thank you for the Prairie Fire and sort of setting setting the stage for us to read in a really enjoyable way um, the bigger picture of what's going on in our food supply. So I am with, you're watching Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. I'm with Dan Armstrong, the uh, novelist who wrote Prairie Fire and a book to look at, Taming the Dragon. Harry McCormick, who himself is a pioneer farmer. More to come. Join us next time.